All right. If you've got your Bible with you, you can turn with me to the book of Acts. We're going to begin Acts chapter 1 this morning. Always a little exciting starting a new book. We only get to do it every three or four years or so. <laughs> Intended to begin Acts right after John, but 1 Peter was about standing faithfully. Standing faithfully in the midst of opposition. Um, and it does seem like opposition is growing in our world to biblical truth and faithfulness to Christ. And so we needed those lessons that 1 Peter had to teach us. So we stuck that in between John and Acts. Um, but in Acts, we are also going to see what it looks like to stand faithfully, of course, uh, in the face of opposition and persecution and all the things the apostles uh, and the disciples and the followers of Jesus go through in Acts. We're going to see in Acts the church on mission, on Jesus's mission. Um, we'll see the foundation, really, of the early church, on the, the foundation on which it was built. We'll see the, the growth of the early church, if you will. We'll, we'll even see where our discipleship vision of Worship Connect Serve comes from. If you remember when we outlined that vision for how we grow as disciples and how we make disciples on the mission Jesus has sent us upon, we took Worship Connect Serve from Acts chapter 2 and what the early church was doing there in Jerusalem to make disciples of the, all the converts after Peter's sermon. So in Acts, we're going to see all of these things played out. We're going to see the importance of discipleship and evangelism. Uh, all of this is, Acts is going to light a fire, hopefully, in you for evangelism and for discipleship and the mission that Jesus has placed His people on. In Acts, we're going to see uh, a plethora of Old Testament prophecies that are fulfilled uh, in references and quotes of the Hebrew Scriptures all through Acts. You're going to see a lot of sermons in Acts. There's lots of sermons uh, by Peter and by Paul and Stephen and lots of different people preaching in Acts. But most of all, Acts really is a connection point. It's a bridge, if you will, between the Gospels and what happens in the Gospels and the epistles, the uh, Romans and Thessalonians, uh, first, second Thessalonians, Colossians, those epistles, those letters. When the, gospel in, when the Gospels end, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the church is there in Jerusalem, in Judea. And that's where it is. Acts shows us how Christianity got from Jerusalem all the way to Rome. But Acts even does more than that. It's a bridge between the gospel accounts and us today because it shows us the beginnings of our mission, shows us that we're part of the story of the church on mission in Acts. In the very last verse of the book of Acts, we'll get there in a few years, it says he, talking about Paul in house arrest in Rome, he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. That's how the book of Acts ends. It's meant to be an unfinished story because the same purpose of Christ in them that we see in Acts the same mission still continues today. We are part of this story. Acts shows us who we are as the church on mission, on His mission. We're built upon the foundation of the apostles of Jesus sent out to preach and proclaim the kingdom of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it shows us how we live out this mission. So as we begin, we're just going to do the first 11 verses today. So let's read those together and, and see how we'll start in chapter 1. It says, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt <clears throat> with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when He was taken up, after He had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom He had chosen. He presented Himself alive to them after His suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, He ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, <clears throat> which He said, You heard from Me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. It's 10 days until it happened, actually. Uh, so when they had come together, they asked Him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel. 
He said to them, it's not for you to know times and seasons that the Father is fixed by His own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when He had said these things, as they were looking on, He was lifted up and a cloud took Him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. Let's pray together. Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that you have in store for us throughout our study of this book and all of the other scriptures as we uh, spend our lives diving into your word. Father, we pray today that you would speak to us. We pray that you would tell us what you would have us to know, that your spirit would come and apply these texts to our hearts and that you would send us out uh, as on mission for you. God, we ask that you would help us, that you would strengthen us to be faithful to who you've called us to be. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So before we launch into the exposition of these 11 verses this morning, we need to make sure we know a few things about the book. Of course, it was written by Luke. Uh, Luke was a doctor, a physician, and he was a companion of Paul. Uh, toward the end of the last half of Acts, we'll see uh, Luke is actually traveling with Paul through, through a lot of this. And so join him on much of his journeys. But even in the introduction of the book, the very first verse, Luke tells us that this is really, Luke's writings, volume two. It's meant to be, it's meant to be the second volume of his work, the first being Luke's gospel that we have recorded for us in Scripture. Acts is meant to be a continuation of the story that Luke began in his first work. If you look all the way back in the Gospel of Luke in chapter one, you'll see that <clears throat> Luke began his gospel in much the same way, saying, I, I set out to make an orderly account of these things, and he addresses it to Theophilus as well, who most people think was a patron, the one who commissioned Luke to write, if you will, to tell the story of who Jesus was and what Jesus did. And here in Acts, in chapter 1, verse 1, Luke addresses Theophilus once again. And look how he summarizes the first book, which is the Gospel of Luke. He says, in the first book, O Theophilus, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. I think he says it that way intentionally. By saying the first book, the Gospel of Luke, was what Jesus began to do and to teach, by summarizing it this way, He intends for us to see Acts, or this book, this second work, as a continuation of what Jesus did and taught. Now we call it the book of Acts. Some of your uh, Bibles may have Acts of the Apostles there. But a more appropriate title <clears throat> would be the Acts of Jesus by His Holy Spirit through the Apostles. But that title is just too long, so we're just going to call it Acts. <laughs> Acts is a continuation of the work of Jesus' mission. Now make sure you understand this. His work for atoning for sin... Going to the cross, rising from the grave, that's finished. Once for all. It doesn't need to be repeated. It doesn't need to be improved on. He did that once for all. He was the only one that could, and he accomplished that mission. But the work of spreading this kingdom <clears throat> to the far reaches of the world, bringing the message of salvation to the world, that was left unfinished when Jesus ascended into heaven. His apostles were to continue that work empowered as they were by the Holy Spirit. And today that mission is still left to His church, also empowered by the same indwelling Holy Spirit. That's what Acts is about. Jesus continuing His work through His people, empowered by the Holy Spirit. One of the best examples of this, I guess, is uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, when <clears throat> after Peter... Excuse me, i got something in my throat. <clears> throat> there it is. <laughs> That's gross, I'm sorry. Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches this sermon, this first Christian sermon. 
And it talks about the apostles preaching and teaching, involved in the word of God. And the church was meeting. And it says as they taught and as they as they worked, as they ministered in Acts chapter two, it said, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It's the work of Jesus still going on today through his people. So Acts chapter one, verses one through eleven it's a continuation of the mission of Jesus. And he continues his mission, he continues his work by preparing and equipping his witnesses in these verses. Jesus is soon to depart from them physically. And they are to be his ambassadors, his messengers, his witnesses. But even after the resurrection, we see that they're still not ready. They're still not ready to live as witnesses. So Jesus spends a period of 40 days preparing them. And it tells us how he does this as he, Luke summarizes it in the first part of Acts. He prepares them with his word and with his presence. He says this is the account of what Jesus began to do and teach. It says in verse 2, until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. This is his word given to them. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during, a, during 40 days and speaking speaking about the kingdom of God. You see this, this is really a summation of what happened at the end of the gospel of Luke. Let me read just a few verses of Luke so you just kind of get the flow of it. At the very end of Luke, after Jesus is raised from the dead, appearing to the disciples, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And this is what he commanded them to do. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The same thing he says in the beginning of Acts. And behold, I'm sending the promise of my father upon you. The Holy Spirit. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. This is the summary. So what, Peter, what Luke is doing, we've been in Peter so long, I'm saying Peter. What Luke is doing is summarizing in Acts, the first chapter, what he has said in Luke, the last chapter. He's telling them Jesus prepared them by giving his commands, by giving his word, by teaching of the kingdom of God over this 40-day period, by presenting himself. With these, with these proofs, these apostles, they were to pass on this message to the world, to testify to the kingdom of God, that the reign of Christ in the hearts of mankind has come. And they received this truth from the very mouth of Jesus as he taught them and showed them in the scripture how it was fulfilled over these 40 days. He opened their minds to see it. How the gospel had been foretold in the, in the Old Testament. And he prepared them by showing himself alive, proving indeed that he was alive. If we went back in Luke 24 again, you could see that Jesus showed them the scars. He, he ate with them. He appeared to them uh, repeatedly over these 40 days. There was no doubt in their minds at the end of these 40 days that their Messiah, their Savior, their Lord was alive. He had defeated death. And therefore... His promises are true. His word is true. If they were to be witnesses to the kingdom of the risen Christ, they needed to be sure, needed to be confident, needed to know beyond a shadow of all doubt that he is alive, that death is defeated, that sin has been atoned for, and his promises are trustworthy. These guys are going to be called to risk everything, to give their lives for this mission. They need to know that his word is true. And so he prepared them. He prepared them with his presence. He prepared them with his word. But he also prepared them to understand that they cannot do this under their own strength. In verse 4 and 5, he says, while he was, And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. This is really important for us to understand today. All the preparation in the world, all the knowledge that you can learn about 
biblical truth. All the skills that you possess in persuasion or public speaking or conversational evangelism, it's not sufficient to empower you for the mission that you've been called on. Even training and experience and, and programs it's not sufficient. The power of God is necessary on your life to be faithful to the mission that He's called us to be on, to be a faithful witness. His power is necessary to live a life of mission. His power is necessary for us to live a life that invests ourselves in making disciples. All of you have been with, as I have, in this situation where you, you, do, you do marvelous things for Christ under the leading of the Lord, and after a while, you just get tired. Maybe your zeal wanes. Maybe it's, you start thinking, well, I've done my part. It's somebody else's turn now. Understand, in your own strength, in your own power, that's how you will always end up. Because we're not sufficient for these things. So Jesus tells them, before you launch off on your own, before you go out and try to conquer the world, Peter, I'm talking to you right here, you need to wait for the promise to be given. Wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit to come, which the Father foretold several times in the Old Testament, that they'd be, power would be poured out from them upon, on high, which they heard from Jesus in the upper room. We looked at it in John. He says, I go away, but I'm going to ask the Father to send another comforter to you, the Holy Spirit of promise, which John the Baptist prophesied about. So he says, go and wait for this promise because you need the power of the Holy Spirit before you launch off into this mission. So as we see Jesus in these first five verses commissioning His apostles, we really see that our faith is built upon a solid foundation. The truth of the message that we share today was handed down to us from the very mouth of Jesus Himself. It was given by those whom Jesus chose. These guys didn't just get together and decide, well, let's do this and we'll teach it this way. No, it was Jesus Christ who chose these men and gave them the truth of what had happened in their, in their witness as they saw His ministry, as they saw His death, as they saw His resurrection. And in a moment in this text, they'll see His ascension. They were empowered by God Himself. The Holy Spirit inspired their writings. And as I said in the first service, if you have questions about how the New Testament was transmitted to us, where uh, you, we know for a fact that what we have in our Bibles today is what the apostles themselves wrote, come talk to me. That's my favorite subject in the world. I love talking about the transmission of the New Testament. But ultimately for here, but because we're short of time, we can trust that we have received the truth of, of God, of what God has given. And likewise, in the commissioning of these apostles here, we understand really what our own mission is supposed to be and how we live out this life of mission, of witness for Jesus Christ. It's got to be based on Jesus' word. It's got to be based on what He has given us. It's not about my opinion. It's not about your opinion or the best way that you think it should be done or, or, or what needs to be communicated. It must be based on His Word and it must be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot do this on your own. You cannot live a life serving Christ on mission for Him in your own strength. I'm telling you right now, you will fail. You may do it for a while, and you may be zealous for it for a while, but there'll come a time when that zeal wanes, and you'll think, what happened to me? What happened to you is you're in your own strength, in your own power, in your own wisdom, trying to live out what only the Holy Spirit inside of you can do. And if you understand this, it really takes the weight of being successful off of you. You're simply called to pass on what you've seen and heard. It's the Spirit of God alone that changes hearts. It's the Spirit of God alone that saves as the, the, the work of Jesus is applied to that heart. And so we see here our mission. Our mission based on the Word of Christ, based on the truth of His resurrection, empowered by the Holy Spirit. 
And that's what we see in the next verses as Jesus explains further what this empowering looks like. He says to them, you need to wait. Wait in Jerusalem for the promise to be given. And they ask him this question in verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Over and again in the Old Testament, the prophets linked the pouring out of the Spirit with the kingdom coming. And now, you know, you really can't blame the disciples for asking this question. It's not an unreasonable question. Over 40 days, Jesus has been teaching them about the kingdom of God. But in the question, you still see wrong presuppositions on their part. The same way we saw in John. They're still looking for a political or a geographic kingdom. They're still looking for a military Messiah that's going to overthrow Rome, establish national Israel to be ruling over the nations. I mean, you can't really blame them as Jewish men. They grew up hearing this. They grew up hearing how the kingdom will be given to Israel. And now here is the Messiah. He's standing right before him. He's proven his divinity by rising from the dead, teaching them about the kingdom of God. And their minds are steeped in these stories of the the earthly kingdom, the kingdom of Solomon, Israel ruling over the nations. All the nations would come to God by coming to Israel, by coming to the temple. And they want the kingdom restored to Israel. The disciples here are looking for power and rulership. They're looking for an immediate earthly kingdom. The same thing we've seen throughout the Gospels. It wasn't too long ago that John and James were arguing, even got their mom involved about who would sit on his right hand. But Jesus doesn't even entertain this question, much less answer it. He says to them in verse 7, It's not for you to know times and seasons that the Father is fixed by His own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. He says in verse 7, this is not something you should be worried about. This shouldn't be your focus. It's not for you to know the times and the seasons uh, of God's purpose and God's plan. Don't fall into this ditch that so many other people have, being consumed with trying to predict when the end will come or when the new heavens the new earth are going to be manifest. I mean, of course, we, we look forward to the consummation of all things. We look forward to those things, and we're told to be ready for His coming for sure. But But that can't be our main focus, our main priority. It can't be what consumes all of our time, all of our energy. There's nothing wrong with studying those things. It's Scripture. We study it. Nothing wrong with seeing the signs of the times and the things getting worse or or getting better or whatever. But that's not to be our passion. That's not to be our focus. We can't be consumed with anything that takes us away from our calling. We have a calling right now. A mission right now. And Jesus tells them, don't be concerned. It's not for you to know about what the Father has in His time, in His season, by His own authority. But this is what you should be concerned about. In verse 8, He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. That's what we're called to focus on. That's what we're called to be our priority. He says, when the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive power. What a statement that is. Reminiscent of Isaiah 32, 15, where he says, Israel will be desolate until power is poured out upon them from on high. Boy, we like that. Like that thought. The power of God on my life. Having the power of God with us. But honestly, if that's the only part of the verse we take, you can make that say anything you want it to say. And many people throughout Christian history have. The power of God on your life. Power for whatever it is you think you want. But Jesus doesn't leave it up to our interpretation. He tells us specifically what this power is for. So that we would be His witnesses. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes and you will be my witnesses. You will testify to the reality of the gospel. You will live out the mission that I'm giving you. The power to make disciples, to spend your life investing in what the world says is foolishness. Notice the statement there in verse 8. It's just a statement of fact. He doesn't say, now listen guys, you really need to just try hard, be my witnesses. No, he says, you will be my witnesses. 
Today you are His. If you name the name of Christ and people around you know it, you are His witness. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. If you name the name of Christ and people around you know it and you live for yourself and, and don't have any kind of uh, reference of Christ upon your life or the way you live, then you're showing people that Christ isn't anybody at all. Blasphemy, if you will. He says you will be a witness. Your lives will be testimony to me. Your lives will be a witness to what the gospel is, the power of Jesus Christ to change hearts. And he tells his apostles here, you won't be witnesses as the nations come to you. You'll be witnesses as you go out to them. He says, you'll be witnesses, testify to proclaim me in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. God told Israel in Isaiah 49, 6, he said, he said, I will make you a light for the nations so that my salvation will reach the ends of the earth. And here's the fulfillment. Here we see the beginning of the salvation that goes out to the ends of the earth, to the far reaches of the world. And incidentally, Acts 1, 8 is, is basically a, um, an outline of the book of Acts. In chapters 1 through 7, you see their ministry there, witnesses in Jerusalem. In chapters 8 through 12, they're in greater Judea and Samaria. And then as the focus shifts to the Apostle Paul in 13 through 28, that's the far reaches of the Roman Empire, all the way to Rome itself. The reality is that the same power that is promised these apostles is indwelling us today as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who've been born again. The same Holy Spirit whom Jesus said would empower you to be His witnesses indwells us today. And He empowers us for the same reason, to be His witnesses, to testify to the reality of the gospel. We're called to be witnesses in every circle of our lives, in our homes as they were in Jerusalem, in our wider circles, as they are in Judea and Samaria, and even to the furthest reaches of the planet. You as an individual and we as a church body, we're called to be witnesses. Man, we spend so much time asking God, what is it you want me to do? You throw a rock in a Christian bookstore and you'll hit a book about how to find God's will. And the reality is He's told you what He desires for you to do. Wherever your feet fall, you're to be a witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Wherever you go, out your front door, when you step out your front door in the morning, wherever it is that you're going, you are to be a witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. In every area, in every sphere, you are to make disciples. You are to be His witnesses at school, at work, at the ball game, at the restaurant. You are called to be His witnesses where He has placed you. And you have been empowered to do so if you are a believer for the Holy Spirit lives within you. Last thing He does to continue His mission as He's preparing His disciples is He provides for His witnesses. It says that when He has said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, that heading might be a little confusing, it might seem strange. You don't see any language in there at all about providing for anything. It's true. I broke my rule this week. My rule is that when I put a heading above those verses, I shouldn't have to say anything. You should be able to read the verse and look at the heading and say, yeah, I see that in there. 
So it's true, there's no explicit language about Jesus providing anything. This is really just a record of the ascension of Jesus. But the problem is that too often we're not taught the importance of the ascension of Jesus Christ. And I have to confess to you this morning, uh, sometimes I'm guilty of it. When I talk about the gospel and the, the death and the burial and the resurrection, we leave out the ascension so often. But the apostles, when they preached, they did emphasize the uh, ascension. Let me show you one example. Peter in this first sermon, Acts chapter 2, we'll get there. He says, this Jesus God raised up. It's Peter speaking. And of that we are all witnesses being therefore, look, exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this, the Holy Spirit, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Peter's explaining the ascension that Jesus is exalted at the right hand of the Father. Receive the promised kingdom. It's by His exaltation that He sends the Holy Spirit in this ascension. As we look at it in Acts, as He goes into the clouds, we're witnessing the coronation of the King. Jesus ascending bodily back to the Father. It's a fulfillment of Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel's prophecy, he says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days. He came up to the Ancient of Days, which is the Father, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall shall not be destroyed. Jesus ascended back to the Father as both God and man. Back to the glory that He had with the Father before the world was, He said in John 17. And in Daniel, this, this shows us that He received the kingdom before He ascended. He said, all power and authority has been given to me and then gave us the commission to make disciples. And when He ascended, He sat down at the right hand of the Father, sat down at the seat of power to reign upon His throne. You really need to get this. Jesus ascended bodily, physically and visibly as both God and man. For the first time in all of eternity, human flesh is enthroned in heaven, reigning at the right hand of God. The ruin of the first Adam is overturned, and humanity in Christ is now restored to relationship with the Father. Because of His ascension, Jesus as God and man sits as King of glory. Because He is still today fully man and fully God, He can atone for man's sin. And because He's both God and man, He's not just our great King this morning, but He's also our High Priest, a man who intercedes for us. I remember having a debate with a guy. It wasn't like a formal debate. It was just, just two knuckleheads talking in the hallway, really. But he didn't believe that Jesus had to give up anything to save us. Now, here, here was his argument. Jesus indeed was God, uh, is God, and he indeed came, took on human flesh. All that was, he agreed with all that. But he said, Jesus, being God, already knew that he was going to die on the cross. I said, I, I can agree with that. Scripture clearly says that he already did know. And he said, and Jesus knew that after he died, he would rise from the grave. I said, I can agree with that too. The Bible says it clearly. Jesus foretold several times that he would rise from the grave. And the man said, so if that's true, if he already knew that even though he was going to his death, he would be alive again and everything would go back to normal, it was just like a theater. It was like a show to show us the love of God, to teach us these things. He already knew everything was going to go back to the way it was. And I said, whoa, that's where I don't agree with you. Everything didn't go back to the way it was. The eternal second person of the Trinity took on the nature of humanity 
took on the nature of mankind, and for the rest of eternity, He will be God and man, and now sits enthroned as God and man. The Father exalted Him to the highest place as God and man, giving Him the name that is above all other names. And because He is God and man, enthroned at the right hand of the Father, the Holy Spirit can come and indwell man permanently. For all eternity, even when you receive your new body in the new heavens and the new earth, you will still be indwelled with the Holy Spirit. God can come and dwell with man because a man has made right the sin that the first man caused. A man kept his law. Make sure you understand, it wasn't a sinful man, it was Jesus, the God-man. Kept his law. Atone for sin. And because of this incredible reality, we who are born again are united with Jesus. Co-heirs with Him. Which means we are there in Christ at the throne of grace Seated with Him. He brought us where He is. Lest you think I'm a heretic, it says so in Ephesians chapter 2. It says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, He, he is, in verse 4, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Look at verse 6. And raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What a colossal reality that is. That we, united in Christ, are with Him. The Father sees us as in Him. Daughters and sons of an all-powerful God. That's miraculous. That's, that's wonderful. We could spend our whole lives dwelling just on this one point of the gospel and you still wouldn't wrap your mind all the way around it. What He accomplished at the ascension because of the death and the resurrection is beyond imagination. Words, words fail me to tell you about the importance and the magnitude of what He provided when He ascended to heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father. I don't know if the disciples understood all that they were seeing. They would when the Spirit comes. But we can certainly understand why they just stood there gawking, can't we? In verse 10, they just stood there. And two men, two men in white, I can't prove it and you can't disprove it, but I think these are the two, the same two angels that Luke talked about appearing to the women at the tomb. I think these are the same two ones. Um, they walked up and they said, why are you gazing into the sky? They stood by them and they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? That word looking is the word we would usually say gazing, longing intently. They standing, standing there just looking into the sky as Jesus has gone. They're dumbfounded. They're marveling. I, I can't blame them. But these two angels come and they give them this mild rebuke. Why are you gazing at the sky? Why are you looking into heaven? Even as miraculous and awe-inspiring as the ascension is, even for those standing there watching it, he says, Jesus didn't command you to be a stargazer. He didn't command you to stand here gawking at the sky, even as miraculous as this is says, this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw Him go. Meaning physically, bodily, visibly. In the same way He will return. They needed to know this. For the past 40 days, Jesus was appearing and disappearing, coming into the room, disappearing from the room. They never knew when He would appear, never knew when He would come, and probably spent their time waiting for Him to show up again. They needed to know, now He's gone. You can't pine away waiting for Him to appear in the room again. He has ascended to the right hand of the Father and now He is seated there. They've been prepared. Soon they would be empowered. Now as Jesus is enthroned in heaven, 
He's provided all that you need to live out your calling. You have all that you need to be His witnesses. Why are you standing here staring up into the sky? The implication of His words just reverberate over us today. What are you waiting for? Why are you staring into the sky, even as marvelous as it is? He's told you what to do. For these apostles, it was go to Jerusalem and wait. The Holy Spirit will come for us in Mulvane. 2,000 plus years later, we have received this promise from the Father. Receive the Spirit. We have all that we need, the power to be His witnesses. This is His call for us. Go and make disciples. Church, what are you gazing at today? What's keeping you from living on mission for Christ as His witness? What has stolen away your focus keeping you from being His witness? Do you think, I can't really get started until I learn more, until I experience more? No, that nullifies the power of the Spirit, doesn't it? Maybe you think, i got to get through this trial first, and then I can focus. No, that also nullifies the power of the Spirit, but you're never going to get through all your trials. We saw that in Peter. Maybe it's just self-protection. I'm scared. I don't want to look stupid. I don't want to be ostracized. What did Peter tell us about that over and over and over again? Today, what's standing in your way to obeying the, the command that Christ gave His church to be busy with while He is gone until He returns? We're going to be looking at this for a long time. Acts is a church on mission. Living out His calling. This is what living for Jesus looks like. When we do what He's called us to do, Make disciples. Witness for Him. That is what a life living for Jesus looks like. Are you living for Jesus today? Maybe there's some in here that have never trusted in Jesus. Maybe you've tried over and over again to reform your life, to do better, to, you know what, you're right. I'm going to get busy. I'm going to... And it never works. Your zeal wanes, your power wanes, your strength wanes, you're distracted by all of the things of the world. And you wake up over and over again over the course of the many years of your life and you say, what happened to me? Where did I go wrong? What happened to that person that I remember? Maybe it's because you know the facts of the gospel but have never entrusted the Lord of the gospel. Give your heart and life to Christ today. And believers... We're going to be in Acts for a good long time. Acts, Acts is about being a witness, living on mission. It's about what we're called at First Baptist Church in Mulvane to be. And that is who we will be. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word today. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the, the beauty of of who you are and who you have made us in you because of your death and burial, resurrection and ascension. God, we, we, we just stand in awe. But God, we confess that we, we don't possess the strength or the will or the power to live out the calling that you've given us. So Father, I pray that you would help us day by day, moment by moment, to be desperately dependent upon you upon your spirit who indwells us. Father, help us to be faithful. Open doors of opportunity for the doors that are already open that we don't recognize. God, slap us upside the head and show us what you're doing in our lives. Show us who we're called to be in the places that you've put us. Lord, and if there's anyone here that knows all about you, knows all about your word, knows all about the gospel, knows all about the cross, but has never entrusted their life to you, I pray, God, that you would draw them to yourself now and that they would trust in you and that your kingdom would grow today in this room. Father, use us as your instruments. We thank and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
As always, I'm going to stand right down here at the front. If you want to come, I would love to talk to you. You must trust in Jesus. He said, all that call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Give your heart and life to Christ. Trust in Him, and then let's get busy on the mission He's given us. Will you stand with me?